When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit by Judith Carr, Chapter 24. It seems strange to be leaving again for yet another country. Just when we'd learned to speak French properly, said Max. There was not time to say goodbye to Madame Socrate because she was still on holiday. Anna had to leave a note for her at the school. But she went with Mama to pay a farewell and visit Great Aunt Sarah, who wished them luck in their new life in England and was delighted to hear about Papa's film. At last, someone is going to pay th that good man some money, she said. They should have done it long ago already. The Fernands returned from the seaside just in time for the two families to spend a final evening together. Papa took everyone out to dinner to celebrate, and they promised each other to meet again soon. We'll come back to France often, said Papa. He had a new jacket, and the tired look had quite disappeared from his face. And you must visit us in London, said Mama. We'll come to see the film, said Madame Fernand. The packing did not take long. There seemed to be less to pack each time they moved. So many things had been used up and thrown away. And one grey morning, less than two weeks after the letter had come from England, they were ready to leave. Mama and Anna stood in the little dining room for the last time, watching for the ta waiting for the taxi to take them to the station. Clear to the litter of small objects in everyday use, which had made it familiar, the room looked bare and cheap. I don't know how we lived here for two years, said Mama. Anna rubbed her hand over the red oil cloth on the table. I liked it, she said. When the taxi came, Papa and Max piled the luggage into the lift, and then Papa shut the door of the flat behind them. When the train drew out of the station, Anna leaned out of the window with Papa and watched Paris slowly slip away. We'll come back, said Papa. I know, said Anna. She remembered how she felt when they had gone back to the Gasthaus Warren for the holidays and added, But it won't be the same. We won't belong. Do you think we'll ever really belong anywhere? I suppose not, said Papa. Not the way people belong who have lived in one place all their lives. But we'll belong a little in lots of places, and I think that may be just as good. The Equinoctical Gales were quite early that year, and when the train reached to pay after the lunchtime, about lunchtime, the sea looked wild and dark under the gray sky. They had chosen the slow crossing from to pay to New Haven because it was cheaper in spite of Papa's newfound wealth. We don't know how long the money will last us, said Mama. As soon as the boat emerged from to pay harbor, it began to pitch and roll. Madonna's excitement at her first sea voyage quickly evaporated. She, Max, and Mama watched each other's faces turn paler and greener until they had to go below and lie down. Only Papa was unaffected. It took six hours to cross the channel instead of the customary four because of the bad weather. And long before they landed, Anna felt that she did not care what England was like as long as they got there. When they finally arrived, it was too dark to see anything. The boat train had left long ago, and a kind of incomprehensible porter put them on a slow train to London instead. It started hesitantly on its w it started hesitantly on its way. A spatter of raindrops appeared on the windows. English weather," said Papa, who was very cheerful because he had not become sea he had not been seasick. Anna huddled in the corner of the compartment, watching the anonymous dark landscape rush past. You could not really see what any of it was like. After a while, she got tired of looking at it and stole a glance instead at two men opposite her. They were English. On the rack above their heads were two black melon-shaped hats, as she had rarely seen before, such as she had rarely seen before, and they were sitting up very straight reading newspapers. Although they had gone on the train together, they did not speak to each other. The English seemed to be very quiet people. The train slowed down and stopped for the umpteenth time at a small, ill-lit station. Where are we? asked Mama. Anna spelled out the name on an illuminated sign. Borville, she said. It can't be, said Max. The last place we stopped at was called Borville. Or Bovril. Mama, still pale from the crossing, looked looked for herself. It's an advert it's an advertisement, she said. Borvel is some kind of English food. I think they eat it with stewed fruit. The train continued to crawl through the darkness and Anna became drowsy. 
There was something familiar about the situation. Her tiredness, the sound of the train wheels, and the rain spattering on the windows. It had all happened before, sometime long ago, before she could remember when. She fell asleep. When she awoke, the train was going faster, and there were lights flashing past the windows. She looked out and saw wet roads and street lamps and little houses, which all looked alike. We are coming into London, said Mama. The roads grew wider and the buildings bigger and more varied, and suddenly the sound of the wheels changed, and they were on a bridge over a wide river. The Thames, cried Papa. It was lined with lights on both sides, and Anna could see some cars and a red bus crawling along beneath them. Then they were across. The river was left behind, and as though a box had been clapped over the train, the brightness of a station with a platform and porters and crowds of people suddenly appeared all around them. They had arrived. Anna climbed off the train and stood on the chilly platform while they waited for Mama's cousin Otto, who was to meet them. All around them, the English were greeting each other, smiling and talking. Can you understand what they're saying? said Anna. Not a word, said Max. In a, f a few months and we'll be able to, said Anna. Papa had got a hold of a porter, but Cousin Otto was nowhere to be seen, so Mama and Papa went to look for him while the children stayed with the luggage. It was cold. Anna sat down in a suitcase, and a porter smiled at her. Francais, he asked. Anna shook her head. Deutsch, she nodded. Ah, Deutsch, said the porter. He was a tubby little man with a red face. Ella, he added. Anna and Max looked at each other. They did not know what he meant. Etla, Etla, said the porter. He placed one finger under his nose like a mustache and raised the other hand in a Nazi salute. Etla, he said. Oh, Hitler, cried Max. Anna said, do they have Nazis here? I hope not, said Max. They both shook their heads vehemently and made disapproving faces. No, they said. No, it, no Hitler. The porter seemed pleased. Etla. He began. He looked round to see if anyone was watching them, then spat forcefully on the platform. Etla, he said. That was what he thought of him. They all smiled, and the porter was just about to do another imitation of Hitler when his ha with his hair pulled down over his forehead when Mama appeared from one side and Papa and Cousin Otto from the other. Welcome to England, cried Cousin Otto, embracing Mama. Then Mama gave a little shiver. He added reprovingly, In this country, you should always wear woolen underclothes. Anna remembered him from Berlin as a rather dapper man, but now he looked shabby in a crumpled coat. They followed him to the exit in a slow procession. There were people all round them. It was so damp that steam seemed to be rising from the ground, and Anna's nostrils were filled with the smell of rubber from the Macintoshes, which nearly all of the English were wearing. At the end of the platform, there was a slight hold-up, but nobody pushed or jostled, as was usual in France and Germany. Everyone just waited their turns. Through the misty air, a fruit stall shone bright with oranges, apples, and yellow bananas, and there was a shop window entirely filled with sweets and chocolates. The English must be very rich to be able to buy such things. They passed an English policeman with a tall helmet and another, and another one in a wet cape. Outside the station, the rain was coming down like a shining curtain, and beyond it, Anna could dimly see some kind of open square. Again, the feeling came over her that this had all happened before. She had stood in the rain outside a station. It had been cold. Wait here, and I'll get a taxi, said Cousin Otto. And this, too, was familiar. Suddenly, her tiredness and the bad crossing and the cold all combined. There was a great emptiness in her head, and the rain seemed to be all about her, and the past and present became confused, so that for a moment she could not think where she was. All right, said Papa, grasping her arm as she swayed a little, and Cousin Otto said in a, a concerned voice, It must have been one, it must be quite difficult to spend one's childhood moving from country to country. At the word, something cleared in Anna's mind. Difficult childhood, she thought. The past and the present slid apart. She remembered the long, weary journey from Berlin with Mama, how it had rained, and how she had read Gunther's book and wished for a difficult childhood that she might one day become famous. Had her wish then come true? Could her life since she had left Germany really be described as a difficult childhood? She thought of the flat in Paris and the Gasthof's Wern. No, it was absurd. Some things had been difficult, but it had always been interesting and often funny. And she and Max and Mama and Papa had, always, had nearly always been together, 
As long as they were together, she could never have a difficult childhood. She sighed a little as she abandoned her hopes. What a pity, she thought. I'll never be fa famous at this rate. They moved closer to, she moved closer to Papa and put her hand in his pocket for warmth. Then Cousin Otto came back with the taxi. Quickly, he cried. We won't wait, or he won't wait. They all ran. Papa and Cousin Otto shifted the luggage. The taxi driver threw it into the taxi. Mama slipped in the wet and almost fell, but Cousin Otto saved her. The English all wear rubber soles, he cried, pushing the last suitcase. When they all piled into the taxi, Cousin Otto gave the address of the hotel. Anna pressed her face against the window, and the taxi started. And that is the end of When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit, and I will see you in the next book.